no Allah Wakba. We didn't see anything. We didn't hear anything. It was just a massive explosion. What's your name? Menachem Mendel Weil. Where are you from? Chicago, originally. When, uh, when did you come to Israel? So we made Aliyah 2010 uh, from Chicago, Sirajah's Park, to Gush Etzion, West Bank, Judea. And I was seven years old. You and your family? Yeah, my family. Yeah, how many, uh, how many members is that? Mom, dad? Four. Four siblings and two amazing parents. Wow, beautiful. God bless. Yeah. And uh, so that was in uh, 2000. 2010. 2010, sorry, let's just say 2007. 2010. And you were what age when you got here? Seven. Seven years old. And you went into uh, like a primary school, like a lab elementary school when you got here? Uh, before there? When I was in Chicago? No, 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 here, here, when you got here. Uh, first grade, second grade, get out of, get out of How was it being uh, an American guy joining uh, in an Israeli school, a new environment? What well, was, you're seven years old, you don't have much choice. You just move with the family and honestly, at that age, you learn, learning languages is very easy. So in a year, I was already having conversations and had a lot of Israeli friends. And it's cool. Fast forward to 18. Yeah. Your conscription, as we call it in the States, your forced uh, military duty. Well, let me just, let me just say before that, I actually did a pre-army program for a year and a half. Uh, we we learn about uh, Israel. We learn uh, all kinds of values and prepare physically and mentally for the army. I did, it, did that for a year and a half. I drafted late. Uh, I drafted when I was uh, March. I drafted March 2023. Wow. Okay. I'm like super freshman. And, and okay, so March 2023, and you were how old at that time? 19. Uh, 19, almost 20. Almost 20. Yeah. And what did you uh, draft into? What unit? Combat engineers. Why a combat engineering? Of all things. Well, it wasn't my premier uh, goal. I wanted to be in the Shed de Chosa, that's like the Navy SEALs of America. Um, I wanted, you know, the way I, I saw it was that we all have to do the Army service and might as well it's not just check it off, but have a meaningful service. So I wanted to be combat. Uh, I wanted to be in higher units. Eventually, uh, God had different plans and I turned out in combat engineering. Okay, still combat unit. Yeah. Walk me through your, your 2023 year experience. Um, lead me up until, into, until October 6th. I drafted 2023 March uh, to combat engineering. I went straight into basic training. Uh, very interesting. Again, this wasn't my ideal unit. I went to get to a more combat and uh, tough unit. But like I said, God had different plans and I ended up there. So I try to make the best out of it. I went through basic training, uh, met a lot of amazing people, great people, uh, and good friends, a lot of training. Uh, you know, I finished my basic training. It was eight months. I finished that, and we're talking already, this is a month after the 7th of October. Uh, that's when I finished my basic training. So you, you were actually training when everything unfolded. What was your October 7th like? Oh, okay. Well, first of all, I was like October 7th. I was in uh, Jaffa, Tel Aviv. Uh, like I said, I was in this pre-army program. So I went there for the holiday. And, you know, I remember in the morning, terrible morning, rockets and sirens. I remember a little of, of davening and it's unclear and this program that people there keep Shabbat, you know, so we don't have our phones on us. And it took a while for us to really understand what was happening. It was just rumors and rumors and the war, rumors that came at some point, I was like, okay, we have to check what's going on. And at that point, I, you know, I started seeing videos on Telegram and everything that was happening in Israel um, and up south and down south. And it was, it was just unbelievable. I mean, it, it was unreal. It was really, it was unreal, it was a shock. What were you feeling at the time that you're sitting in Jaffa, in Tel Aviv, you're 50 kilometers away from, or 100 kilometers away, I should say, from the action. What was the feeling that you had? 
Well, I will say for me, the experience was uh, in the evening of the October. At that evening, there was a bunch of barbecues. Because in that area over there, Jaffa, Tel Aviv, um, it's, you don't feel like Tel Aviv. It feels like Lud or Ramlin. Because it's predominantly Arab. Yeah, exactly. Um, so again, and that night there was barbecues all around. You can only do one plus one to understand what, what was happening there. Um, but because I was in that area for a year and a half, the second I realized in that morning, I looked in videos and I was seeing what was happening in our country. I was the only guy with a rifle. Uh, I wasn't at my base, but I had my rifle with me. I had my equipment. And I was just seeing these videos and I was already, you know, I'm processing and I'm thinking like, it might get here. It might get here and, and our, our neighbors over here might turn on, on us. Um, again, anything's possible. You see these videos and realize anything's, anything's possible. What were you seeing? I was seeing people getting murdered in the streets, people getting kidnapped. Um, the Gaza uh, uh, border being breaked. Uh, people in, 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 in the villages in the south. Um, pure, pure murders. And a bunch of blood, a bunch of... And did you feel hopeless? being far away from that action? I did. I did feel hopeless. Um, I mean, the place where I felt my, where I was, like I said, I was the only guy, I was, I was the only guy with a rifle over there. And knowing the people surrounding us in Jaffa Tel Aviv, I was alert, as, 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 as alert as you can get. Um, you know, I remember the, Ember scenario, you know, the sirens are going on and and all of my all of my, all of our guys are going down to the uh, shelter to the shelter. And I remember from seeing these videos, I did one plus one and I imagined a scenario where these uh our terrorists terrorists in the area will just, you know, come in. They know the sirens are happening, they know people are in the shelters, they're gonna come in, throw are in the shelter and like it's easy. It's, so at that moment, I'm just, this is what's running in my, in my head. So what's running in a 21 year old's head, uh, at the moment. So what I did was I was just, I was above the shelter, uh, with fire rifle, uh, magazine inside, ready, just, just ready for the scenario. I was, again, it's after the videos I saw, it was like, anything's possible. I, I better be ready for the worst. And so you're you're experiencing October seven like most in this country, yeah. completely uh, taken <laughs> taken by shock. Shock isn't even the right word. Lead me to the time that you now go from being in basic training, being on this trip, to putting on your uniform. For sure. Well, I actually I will say also something about uh, you know before when the war started. Like I said, I was still. I had another month in basic training while this war is happening. For me, that was one of the toughest months. I mean, talking about that hopeless feeling that I think all Jews in the whole world uh, uh, felt at that time, where it was like, I have brothers and sisters with skin lives. People are dying. People are getting injured every single day. And what, where am I in this scenario? What am I doing to help? And, okay, I was still in basic training, but in my, in my head, I was like, okay, let's move forward. Like, I'm ready. I'm ready, like, or, in my head it was, or let us go home and let us be with our families at this difficult time, because who knows what's, what's, what's gonna happen, or put us in already, like, I'm ready. Yeah. That's, that's what I felt, so it was a very tough month for me. Um, eventually, obviously I'm speaking to you today, so I went in, uh, we went in, actually it was a funny story, we finished our basic training, they let us go home for a couple of days to see the family, and how's your family doing at this time? They were still in Judea Samaria. Was still in Judea Samaria. What the world knows as the West Bank. Yeah, exactly. We're still in that area. Uh, everyone's together. The whole family's there. Uh, they're doing. I mean, they're doing good. None of them were hurt or injured. Um, but of course, we're all heartbroken. Our hearts are into pieces, you know. Um, I remember getting home. I at that night, I was catching up with some friends. You know, when you're in the army, you don't you don't get free time. And I'm catching up, and we go to get some drinks, and we have a good night. I go back home, fall asleep. Next morning, this is two days after they let us go home, after eight months of basic training. 
I go home, I wake, I wake up in this morning from a call from my commander. I'm all like, I'm, I'm hangover. And this, is, yeah. this is how I wake up. I wake up, I'm all like out of it. What's up? We start talking and he informs me that I should, you know, I'm give my uh, family uh, hugs and kisses and tomorrow I'm going into Gaza. And it was, uh, it was a moment. I mean, it was mixed feelings. I want to have, this is what I drafted for. And I, I, I was just waiting to get in, so I was happy. On the other hand, it's war. People died and people are dying and people are getting injured. Like, it's, it's scary. So mixed feelings, uh, a lot to process. How'd you break that news to your family? So at the beginning, I was thinking, I was actually thinking to, uh, of lying to my parents. But I was like, you know, at the end of the day, we're in God's hands and whatever is supposed to happen will happen. And I don't want them, I don't want them to worry for no reason. Like, so I was thinking of lying to them and telling them I'm just going back to base or whatever. But then I thought about it and I was like, well, you know, if I actually don't come back, I want to make sure I have that last hug with my, you know, like my family and speak with them for the last time. They'll have some, a last conversation. It's pretty crazy, but it's true. You know, all, everyone who goes into Gaza, we all go to Gaza. You go in in a mentality that you might not come back. That's just the reality of it. So uh, it's tough. And so you head off two days later and you report to a base down south? Yeah, you report to a base uh, down south, prepare the vehicles, prepare everything, and they, we go in. And what were you told when you arrived that your mission assignment was at that time? And give me a timeline. So where, where are you now? You're about November, end of November, if I've calculated correctly. Actually, with my fingers, because I haven't actually... Because at the beginning of the war, you had a month left the base of training. Then you had the two days off. So now you're about like mid, mid-November. Mid to yeah, well, I was I was I was in Gaza for almost a month, and I got injured on the twelfth. We're twelfth of December. December. Yeah, so okay, so you yeah you were in the second week of uh, November. Second week. Oh. So your second week of November, you arrive to this base down south, and what are you told that your missions, your assignments, what's your objectives? Well, it's uh, funny in Gaza. It's you have times where you go you go out and you go back in, you go out and you go back in, but. It wasn't like missions where you go in for a day and you go out. Like, you're living here and you go in for a while. So it wasn't one mission. Uh, the mission is to destroy Hamas, to bring the house to get back. Um, but as the combat engineering unit, what was your unit's so what, yeah, objective? So, so what, what we specialized and what I did, you know, because I was there for almost a month, what we did there was we were the guys... Um, exploding tunnels, um, exploding buildings, uh, dealing with booby traps. We were pretty much the front line of IDF. You know, the IDF, they don't move forward uh, if we're not in the front. So it's very important work, uh, but it's very dangerous. Well, and when you first crossed into Gaza, you know, you get that call, you're reporting down south, you're setting up the trucks. Yeah. There's a morale, there's an energy, we're going in, it's time. What were you feeling at the time that you're sitting in the Humvee or in the vehicle that's crossing the border from Israel into Gaza? It was a, it was a, I would say it was, a, it was a scary moment. It was definitely a scary moment. I mean, we headed out into Gaza while we're on an open vehicle. So this is a vehicle that if we get hit by, any, it's not protected. So any boards, shots, RPGs, missiles we, we would kill us. And and I'm aware we're at war. This is pure war. What's happening over there? I mean, so it was scary. I remember going through and everything's uh, just destruction everywhere. Um, smoke everywhere. It was scary, but the adrenaline was in the air, and I was—I felt ready. You know, like I was 
And where where were you, were you heading to that first night or day when you were going in and where you were to like northern Gaza? The that first day, like that first entry into Gaza, you're heading north, and what did you do? Well, the first day, I would say the first couple days, we were. I joined. It wasn't organic, our team. Uh, I joined. Uh, combat engineering team who were already in there for a while. I don't know these guys. Uh, which is pretty interesting to think about it. You know, that these guys that I'm fighting beside it, I can, these weren't the guys that did basic training. I don't know them. Uh, they're not like close friends or whatever, but so for me, it took, it took a little while to really understand how things work. Um, and how we roll. Um, and again, just to remind you, like, I'm super fresh. I just finished my basic training. I'm not like some guy with some crazy experience. Mm. I'm the opposite of that. I'm very, very fresh. You know, we learn everything we learn was more th uh, theoretical. And in a split of a second, you have to, you know, you're dealing with life and death. And, um, yeah, it's pretty crazy, man. But I, how many people from your basic training? from your combat unit, basic, excuse me, your combat engineering unit, yeah. basic training, ended up going into Gaza with you at that time? Well, at that time we were chosen, it was like 15 guys. Uh, they chose, the high commanders, they chose 15 guys they felt they can trust and 50 guys that are ready uh, to join other combat units. When you, when you join this other combat unit, did you feel that these guys had your back no matter what? Well, for sure. Again, it's like uh, it. After a couple of days, we already. I already got the role. I already met people. You know, I got their names. Um, had some laughs together, and uh, I think the, you know the the brotherhood in Gaza while you're fighting is so real. It's as real as it gets, um, and you can not know people, but a week in Gaza is like a year or months mm. out in your normal life, you know what I'm saying? So it's, you become so connected uh, in a matter of days. In a matter of days, you trust them and you, you go you go after them and they go after you. And you trust them, they trust you. And that's just how, you know, the, again, the brother. Did you, did you sleep that first night that you were in Gaza? Like, what was the feeling? Like, you know, you get all these uh, sounds that are explosions and bombs and rockets and RPGs and fighting. What was that feeling like, you know, yeah, I'm now sleeping in Gaza. I'm no longer sleeping in the West Bank or on the border where I'm. Oh, it was very interesting. It was very interesting because the first, the first night, you know how it works is, uh, your buddies, you sleep, but there's always people on the guard, always on the watch because you're in Gaza. And what that means is you go to sleep, for however time is, however much time you can, and one of your buddies wakes you up later to switch off, and then you guard, and then he sleeps. And it's like that on and on, 24-7. So at night, I remember the first night sleeping there, which is in northern Gaza, it was very... <laughs> I remember guarding. I had one sleeping. I was guarding with a friend of mine, and I was hearing, like, little noises outside. And in my head, I was just like... Like, any second, any second... A terrorist will pop in the window, Allah walk about and try to shoot us mm -hmm. with an RPG. Like it was just, and it that that that's what I imagined at that moment. So I was like super alert, very aware of these small noises and just looking around. Uh, my rifle, I was ready just to to fire, and it was uh, it was intense. The first night, and it was very intense. That what what was a moment that you had? You know, and we're going to get to your injury, but what was a moment that you had where you were like, oh, shit, this is real. I'm here. Uh, well, 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 tell me about that. Walk me through that. Actually, interesting. I never, this is like, actually, never actually thought about the moment. I feel like recently I've been processing so much of the injury and my recovery process and what's up for future Mendel. Never actually thought about that. Uh... It's crazy how much there's to process. I mean, all of us, but I mean, me especially, the amount of things I've been through this, I mean, 
past year? Uh, I'm not sure. I think I got to think about that. I'll come back to it. Look at that. <laughs> yes, sir. So, so walk me through. Sadly, I've learned you've been injured. Yeah. I mean, you're now sitting in front of me, so you've gone through a insane recovery. This one. But walk me through what led to your injury. Your injury. Well, what happened to you? So, like I said, I was in northern Gaza for almost a month. Uh, we did a, a lot of work over there. I'm very proud of myself and proud of our team and the unit. Uh, you know, the day I got injured, it was 12th of December. It was a sunny day. It was a Tuesday. Just in the afternoon, you know, we I was waiting with, uh, with my friends in the vehicle. We were waiting for our next mission, and we got it. And our mission was to move forward. This is in Jabalia, northern Gaza. That to move forward and, you know, for IDF to continue moving forward, there was a certain amount of buildings that we had to take down. Now, of course, clear these houses first and then take them down with our explosives. And so, we, you know, we start moving forward. And I'm going to interrupt you. When you're moving forward and, and during this time, did you encounter civilians or tunnels or terrorists? Well, let me just say, first of all, Tarl's thing, we, we've encountered tunnel, um, numerous amounts of tunnels, not on this specific mission, but before then. Mm. Um, civilians, not at this mission, but we've seen earlier civilians. And what was the encounter like as IDF is doing their work? Yeah. There are civilians. Uh, so I was actually very, you know, I'm I'm not a commander. Uh, I'm a simple soldier who just finished basic training. So I'm not the guy talking to these civilians or dealing with them. But just seeing the scenario from the side, it was very, I was, uh, I was proud. I was proud of the, being part of IDF because what we were doing is we were on one of our missions. We were going to clear houses uh, and take them down. And I didn't see these. I didn't. I wasn't in the houses where the civilians were. But my friends were. And first of all, just scenario. I just want to share the scenario. I had a friend. He shared with me uh, on this day where he 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 goes in the house and they're clearing the house. And you know, they're again you're in Gaza. There's terrorists everywhere. Uh, the terrorists, you don't know who's a civilian and who's a terrorist. That's because they wear civilian clothing. They wear civilian clothing, uh, part of this, I mean, you just don't know. Um, so it's a crazy scenario, and he goes in, and he starts clearing the house, and he goes through one room, and he opens his rifle, and a kid, like, I don't know, seven years old, starts walking towards him. I just imagine the scenario. We're at war. We already know that these terrorists, they use the civilians as human shields. That's part of it. And the other part where so much of the civilians are actually part of terrorism, like, you have a 21-year-old dealing with this kind of scenario. It's unbelievable. Oh. Uh, what we had to deal with. And he was telling me, like, it was a crazy moment. And he's waiting there. He's alert, right? He's not will shoot and afterwards elders come out from behind um eventually our team they took him outside and they they first of all they talked to him make sure they're not terrorists and they uh took them away uh, they didn't kill him they put them in a safe place but these are just kind of like crazy scenarios where young people like us uh 21 year olds 19 year olds have to deal with such a complex this scenario. Mm -hmm. You're dealing with people's and well, dealing with life, life and death. Yeah, uh, he didn't shoot her at the end. He, he, I remember him sharing with me afterwards. Like he felt like he could, he, he couldn't pull the trigger. Like he just saw a child. Is, but uh, but it's a, it's really a scene out of a movie. And it is what your friend was describing. I would say this, this you know the whole center of October it wasn't even like. It wasn't even a horror movie. It was more than a horror movie. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, 
there's that part and the part of us uh, uh, soldiers fighting in Gaza having having to deal with crazy scenarios scenarios that you find in movies definitely and as 21 year old you you emphasize a lot about the 21 year 20, 21 year old thing that uh, being so young and it, it seems that that's something that's like obviously like like through your processing that, that it's like wow I'm a 21 year old kid and I've gone through things that people God willing will never have to face in their life sure no, well, it's very, it's very human, you know. I mean, it's the IDF soldiers are are such a, you know, me for example, before the war, before the army, I'm an athletic guy. I like going fishing. I like, you know, I go on the bike. I do flips. I do parkour. I play basketball, play soccer, go swimming. I like to hang out with friends. You know, grab a drink at the bar. Like a normal guy. As normal guy, as human as it gets. And we are the same people needing to save lives, take lives, seeing you know, the things we see. We see dead bodies. We see, you see our friends die in front of our eyes. It's, I think it's just, it's a, it's something I think it's important to understand. You know, we're not killers. We're not machines. We're not like, we're guys. We're we're just no one wants to risk. I mean, no one wants to risk their life. We have. I mean, we're talking about also reserves of people, people, businessmen, family members, children. Everyone's stopping their life and going and fighting. It's not because we wanted to fight. No one wants to risk their life. Our, all of our lives are precious, and we, you know. But it was it was a need. It was, you know. What's uh? Let, let's go back to the time in Gaza. Yeah, you you were telling me you were beginning to tell me, and then I interrupted you. Uh, the, yeah. about, about the injury. Tell, tell me the day, well, I'm sure what happened. So again, it was 12 of December. We, in northern, northern Gaza, Jabalia, we kind of, we got this mission. Uh, me and another eight guys, we were leading the team by foot. We had army vehicles and tanks behind us. And we're leading the team. We're moving forward. We're kind of going between buildings. And at some point, we got to an area, this wasn't even our destination, but it was a very, very open, exposed area where we had to cross. And nothing safe in Gaza, but you try to make, make it as safe as possible. Uh, and the way we did that was, I was covering from behind, uh, me and another two friends, and our guys were crossing this, open area by pairs so that way if we get hit then you know we minimal damage um and that's what we did uh our team my friends start to cross this area and a little bit before it was my turn you know this is just out of nowhere no Allah Wakba. we didn't see anything we didn't hear anything he was just a massive explosion. And, you know, in a split of a second, I find myself in a scenario I never imagined to find myself. The scenario was, you know, I, I have to say, me going into Gaza, I think me and most of the soldiers' mindset, you go in with the mindset that if I encounter a terrorist, I will take cover, you know, we'll do that teamwork, I mean, we're gonna kill the terrorists and we'll be victorious. Imagine a gunfight, like in the movies. That's what, go, that's what goes through your head. You don't imagine a scenario getting hit by a missile and being hopeless. Mm. And the scenario came to life and, you know, what happened was we got surprised, we got hit by an RPG against tanks, double liner, very high explosive, you know, this explosive is about, it's supposed to hit a tank, damage the tank, and the people inside it. They shot it at my friend, Uriah Akov, a rest in peace, who shot at his body, it hit his stomach directly. So he died on the spot, he was part of the vanished, part of was in pieces. 
And me and another three friends of mine, we all went flying uh, full of shrapnel pieces, full of shock. Uh, chaos, pure chaos, pure chaos. Um, you know, I find myself laying on the floor, bleeding out, full of shrapnel pieces. My ears are all beeping. I can hardly hear. I've, in a split of a couple seconds, I realized we got surprised and we got hit, but I didn't know what was happening. And the scenario was so unknown. I mean, my injury was unknown. I didn't know who was alive, who was dead, what we got hit by, how much terrorists, like, are they coming at us right now? Like, mm. and I'm hopeless because I'm laying on the floor. I can't get up. I got shrapnel pieces in my left leg, my, my stomach, my left arm. I couldn't get up. And I, uh, I was just totally hopeless. And, you know, part of the part of things I was seeing at that moment was I'm laying down and I see pieces of my friend in front of my eyes, which, even without knowing the scenarios, got to do one plus one. And, you know, at, the, at this moment of life and death, it was mainly two points I thought about. Um, the first one was thought about family. Thought about my family, close friends. Like, thought about what would it do if I don't survive and come back home. And just that thought of what it would do to my my family, it gave me that mental strength. Because in a scenario like I was, what you want to do most is you want to close your eyes and get over with. You just seeing your friend die in front of you. You're full of pain. Adrenaline is in the air. You don't know what's happening around you. And I forgot to mention, but it didn't end here. When we thought it couldn't get worse, it got worse because they started shooting us with their rifles. So I'm laying on the floor, and these bullets are flying over my head. I can't, I can't fight back. I can't get up. So that was the first thing. The second thing I thought was... Like, I just finished high school, man. I finished high school. I drafted to the Army. I am 21 years old. I don't got kids. I don't got family. Still didn't climb the Everest. Still didn't do an Ironman. Like, in the big picture, I did not leave my mark in this world. And these are the thoughts that are popping in my head at this moment where I don't know if I'll live or die. And it's tough thoughts. It's... Definitely tough things to think about. Eventually, teams, you know, IDF in the area, they heard that explosion and they came to help. And our team, which were behind us, the rescue team came and the tanks came. And, um, you know, crazy story. But the guy who actually saved my life on the spot, you know, this is the guy who put a tourniquet on my arm, tourniquet on my leg, a bandage on my stomach. You know, this is a matter of seconds, you know, a couple more minutes or seconds of bleeding, and it's, it's a matter of life and death. So this same guy who saved my life and gave me this first medical treatment on the spot while we're, you know, this uh, firing blowing around, he himself was injured, and he himself had a 100 shrapnel pieces in his body. Uh-huh. His name is Mayan Mulo. He's my personal hero. And I didn't even realize he was injured at that spot because this guy's standing up he's like mendel did you know stay calm stay with me and it was a very serious guy told me to stay stay uh don't move you know he was cutting my vest with this commando knife uh to see the wolves and he he just gave me that treatment he saved my life he got me in the stretcher and i remember like it was yesterday i remember the him screaming you know uh we got the first guys ready and get mendel on the stretcher and he gets me on he puts me in the vehicle and you're a coherent you're anything conscious at this time? I'm conscious throughout, from the moment I got injured to the moment I was in the hospital, I was conscious. Uh, and they get me in this vehicle, on the vehicle, they put another tourniquet on my leg, and they give me some drugs. Um, and still conscious. They move me towards the border of Gaza, where their special rescue team 669 uh, rescued me with their helicopter, with their chopper, and took me to the hospital. 
you know, just some, if I'm sharing with you, you know, the story and moments, you know, I had some moments on the helicopter too. You know, I remember when I was, when I was up there, I was all covered up. Um, again, full of drugs and a lot of pain. And I remember I asked the, one of the guys on the chopper, I called Frere and I was like, it's like, does it matter if I stay mentally strong? Like if I stay mentally in the game, like, does it matter? Or like, I'm in good hands, you know, it doesn't matter. I can fall asleep or whatever. And he laughed and he was like, yeah, it's good. It's good. So at this moment, I started, I remember started to sing Am Yisrael Chai. Like Am Yisrael Chai. I was trying to sing that. And, you know, they were smiling, of course. All the guys in the chopper were smiling. And, you know, in, in an hour, 50 minutes, since I, since we got surprised, I was already in the surgery room in the Sheba Hospital, uh, which is crazy. And I was surrounded by doctors, um, so much people, man. It's crazy. A whole, whole crew, a whole unit. I had a whole unit over me, you know? And where was your family at the time? So at the time, well, actually, yeah, it's perfect timing. I actually just got there, and before, before they put me to sleep, this guy comes up to me and tells me, you want to talk to your parents? I was like, of course. And I, I, I don't know how, I, I don't even know how I remember, like, his phone number, or I was able to speak. I, I don't know. But I was able to, I dialed the number, I called my dad. Uh, this is what happened. I'll tell you. What's up, dad? Uh, I got injured, I'm hospitalized, but I'm okay. Lord, that's it. They take the phone, they put me to sleep. Uh, and then I went through hours of surgery. It was like six, seven hours. No, it's interesting. Uh, my parents got a phone call from me being injured. I mean, first of all, they heard my voice. Second of all, I said I was okay. Can't be that bad, right? Mm. But... Until they show up to the Until they, exactly. Until they show up to the hospital. They show up to the hospital and they're waiting, you know, those are the waiting room uh, for this. While well, I'm in the surgery and they're waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And then that's, that's the point when they realize it's, it's serious. Uh, it was a scary moment for them. What, what were your exact injuries? So we all sh can show you the pictures, everything afterwards, but it's, it was, I got shrapnel pieces on my left leg, uh, my left arm. And in my stomach, my lower stomach. And the pain that you felt, undescribable. It's undescribable. I, I have to be honest. I, if not for adrenaline, I would die just for an amount of pain. Mm. Um, it's incredible. I, it's undescribable the amount of adrenaline you feel at the moment. Um, when did it hit you that you got so severely injured like when, when did it like yes okay when the adrenaline calms down and you come out of surgery was there a point in your recovery how long was your recovery first so i was i was uh, hospitalized for two and a half months two and a half months full of uh, uh multiple surgeries uh, a bunch of physical therapy hydrotherapy uh bandages a lot just the whole whole process um i think i realized how severely I was injured and what the scenario was when when I was in bed and I couldn't walk. You know, it took me a week. Only after like a week, I started to drink slowly, slowly and eat. I didn't drink or eat for a week. Uh, they connected me to tubes and would put it like... Uh, Hard. Yeah. But again, this is coming from... Before this injury, I was running marathons. I was running 42 kilometers, and working out, doing flips. It's at my peak. And suddenly, I get to this point where I'm laying in a bed. I, I can't stand on my feet. I can't walk. I guess, like, uh, the simplest thing. We, we all, we walk. We don't even realize we walk, but we still walk. Like, I couldn't walk, man. I couldn't take a shit. So this was when I really realized, I mean, this is bad. And what kept you motivated through the time that you were, you know, in the hospital and you were recovering? What was, what were the things 
that allowed you to propel through because I'm sure you had dark days. For sure. Or I will say the things that strengthened me back then and what strengthens me until this day. It's a combination of a couple of stuff. Um, the first thing is our brothers and sisters are not living today so we could live. What I mean by that is pretty literal. They're not, they died for us to live in this country, for this country to be here. So we better make sure that wasn't for nothing. We better make sure they didn't die for nothing. And therefore, I don't have the right. I don't have the right to sit in bed, you know, depressed, to give up. People have died for us. People have fucking died for us. We cannot, I can't, I can't let myself just to be depressed and give up. That's, you know? Uh, so that's, that's one point, yeah. That's one point. Another point is, you know, after, yes, I was in a bad, I was in a bad scenario. I couldn't walk. I was feeling like shit in there, but I'm alive. And at those moments where I was laying on the floor bleeding out, not knowing if I would live or die, you know, after that, being alive, only then it hit me how precious life is, how short it is, and how it can be taken from us in a second. Mm. And the whole only hit me then where it's like, life is short. Life is short. And we don't know when our, you know, God, God takes it whenever, whenever it's time. So that definitely pushes, you know, it gives you motivation, like to get on your game, stay positive, you know, try to move forward. And I would say this, this wasn't, this didn't motivate me back then because then I, was, I still couldn't walk. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you right now, seven months afterwards, what motivates me, what gives me a lot of strength is knowing what I've been through and where I'm standing today. Mm -hmm. Knowing that I got hit by, three mirrors for me, we got hit by an RPG against tanks and I'm alive. I'm standing with all my limbs. And my starting point was that I couldn't walk, I couldn't take a shit, I couldn't eat, I couldn't do the most simplest stuff. And today, seven months afterwards, I am flipping, I'm running, I'm working out, I'm going out with friends. I'm strong. mentally, physically, I'm still, still getting there. Mentally, I'm stronger than ever. Would you do it all again? Just... Wow. If somebody said to you, no, I think, guys, no, I, well, Oh, wait, you're talking about the injury or like... No, no, I'm saying like somebody says to you tomorrow, Medal, we need you. You're going back to Gaza. What are you saying? That's tough, man. I, I will say I'm actually currently, I'm out of the army because of the injury. Um, so a scenario like that wouldn't, wouldn't happen. There are hypotheticals here. Hypothetical, <laughs> yeah. You're allowed to say no. You know, at the end of the day, it's very easy for people to say... Yeah, I would go back, you know, we sat with Alon, Alon, a crazy guy that he is, he was like, I'm going back. Uh, but, you know, then reality hits, because then you're, you're sitting in Sheba, or sitting in the recovery, and it's easy to say that, but you come out and you enjoy the small, simple things, like you said, going to the bathroom, walking. I will, I will say, I think the main reason I would say, well, first of all, Definitely, we're talking about reserves or uh, Israel getting into uh, another time into a critical condition. Therefore, that they need more soldiers and they need me too. Then I'll be there. And I think that's, I don't think, I know that's the scenario of all Am Yisrael. Uh, we've seen it. But not in a case like that, I, I wouldn't go back. And I will say... The reason I wouldn't do that is because being through, after being in an experience like I've been through, we we're close to life and death, and after utilizing how life is short and how precious life is, and going back to that moment where I'm laying down, bleeding out, not knowing if I'll live or die, thinking about how I didn't, my mark wasn't left in that like feeling of 
what would you call that? Like missing out, like, mm -hmm. like I did not leave my mark. Like this cannot end here and now. You know, and after having that experience, I'm so fired up to leave my mark. Did you feel like you were gonna die in that moment? It was a question mark. I didn't feel like I was gonna die, but it was a question mark. It was just, like, is this it? That's it? Huh? Was I, is this it? Oh, is this it, sorry. Yeah. That, that's what I was thinking at this, at that moment. It wasn't like, this is over, I'm done. And it wasn't like, oh, easy peasy. Mm -hmm. It was like, just so much happening at once that like, yeah. you didn't really even get the chance to, was it? Yeah, just a question mark. Yeah, that's it. Interesting. You're a real life hero. I know you probably don't like to hear that, but you are. Because there's a lot of people, look, I'm 29, uh, you're 21. And uh, I can't discount my life or other people's lives who are older than you, but you've been through things that people will never, God willing, will never have to, you know, go through. So yeah. I want you to know that uh, you have an incredible, you have an incredible story. What is, take me now, life after the recovery, or you're still recovering, of course. Yeah. But life after the hospital, life after the army for you. Um, as an American, somebody who grew up in Chicago for a short bit of their life, you know, seeing what's going on in the Western world and in the States and in Europe, all over the world for that matter, yeah. the talk and the narrative against Israel and the Jewish people, how does it make you feel? It's tough, especially having that question mark if we actually have the support some of the board uh, it is tough I you know a good good friend of mine since the 7th of October he says since from us, the 7th of October all Jews throughout the world got a Tzav Shmoner meaning we're all called up, called up for reserves for one guy it's reserves actually carrying a gun for one guy who beat you know charity or coming to Israel, or making barbie like barbecues for the soldiers, whatever. You've all been called up, um, and I think just moving forward, where what's next, what's next for Mendel? Um, you know, I still feel like, like you know, just just recently, I was in I was in America for a month, uh, speaking and sharing my story and sharing what I saw in Gaza and. Um, even just speaking, and you know, of course, this this was on behalf of Sheba Hospital. I was raising money for the hospital, but again, I've been there and I've spoke to all kinds of Jewish communities uh, throughout the U.S. And after this trip, I've realized how meaningful it was and how important it was uh, for people to hear our stories, for people to get a little of an idea of what we go through, what we've been through, um, and more and even more, like we're we're all pretty much like broken, you know. It touched all of us. Uh, we all need to, you know, give um, strengthen each other at this time. And me coming back from my background with my story, you know, fighting in Gaza, getting injured, close to life from death, having a crazy recovery process. Uh, for real, I think my recovery process is probably one of the like fastest recovery process in, in the ho at the hospital, you know, like not real that only you know from not be able to walk after you know, after seven walks and seven months, ready flipping. So me having my story, I realized how meaningful it was and how much it, it actually gives people strength and hope, and that's that's what I plan on doing in the future. You know, I plan on this close future, you know, to go to schools, universities, our Jewish communities throughout the whole U.S. and just speak, share my story, share my background, you know, my thoughts, and I'll give strength to the Jews out there. What's your message to the Jews out there? The Jews out there. First of all, I love you guys. <laughs> um, and I will say, you know, I, there's a connection I've never felt where only after the 7th of October, I felt this deep, I feel this deep connection throughout with all, all Jews throughout the world where I meet, 
So they're my family, they're my brothers and my sisters. Um, I love them and I, you know, I was hospitalized for two and a half months. And for these two and a half months, I'm telling you, Americans from all over the world, Australia, New York, Los Angeles, Miami, Canada, people all over were visiting us in the hospital. Uh, and, and you know, it's different. That guy comes to hear your story. That guy comes to, yeah, to get charity. Some give presents, come, some come just to they just to be there with us and support us. And my point is we got I got so much support from Jews all over the world. So you know, I, I, I see you guys, I saw your support. I am more than grateful. Um What's your message to the non Jews who are countering everything that's happened and says that it's not true? And in all the anti-Zionists, anti- Well, I think, I think the truest thing you can do, the media, there's fake news everywhere, man. Uh, I'm not even saying to choose a side. I would say listen to both sides. And the biggest thing, come to Israel. Like, see for your own eyes. See for your own eyes. And then you make up your decision, who you support and who's, who, what's evil and what's... Where's the good and where's the evil? You know, who's right, who's wrong? Or, or, you know, build your own perspective. Come to Israel and see it for your own eyes. There's nothing more real than that. We can't trick you over here, you know? Come see it with your own eyes. That's the tell us. Go back to Gaza for a second. Outside of your injury, outside of, you know, the story that you shared with me of your friend to the young child, were there things that you saw and witnessed with your own eyes that you couldn't have imagined even with the intelligence and the stories you heard coming out of Gaza. What was the time where you were like, wow. This is how like shocked of what I saw there? Yeah, this is real. Definitely. I think, you know, those times we went and I went in uh, multiple buildings, civilian buildings. You, I got in a building and there's a couch, there's a sofa, there's a there's, uh, there's nuts outside, teacups, a television, pictures of the family. Like everything, is, everything looks normal. It looks like a normal civilian house. And then we go downstairs, and under the staircase, we find rifles. And then under one of the blankets over there, you find an RPG, and you find grenades, and you find uh, um, Hamas and vests, with, you know, patches of Hamas. And it's just so shocking if it's that or, or like you go to another building and you see, see a, uh, like a notebook, you open it up and you see pictures of children holding guns with Hamas flags. Like you see these stuff or, you know, again, another scenario, you know, we were in this hospital and three meters outside of the hospital, you had a massive opening to one of the like biggest tunnels over there. And it was just so shocking. I mean... For me, it was two points. First point, how Hamas views these civilians, you know, that's the first point. And the second point is, which I think is a bigger point, how much of these civilians are not actually civilians. And the terrorism is just absolutely everywhere. Everywhere. It's full of terrorism. Tunnels everywhere. Houses are connected. Hamas support shit and almost every single like any most of the houses we've been in it's unbelievable it's one thing to hear about it and it's one thing to see it with your own eyes you know and when I've seen it with my own eyes it was shocking mm. what do you say to people who will say yeah but Israelis hold rifles in their house and the reason that people in Gaza civilians, not civilian Hamas, not Hamas, that they have all this ammunition is because they need it to protect themselves from an occupation and, you know, the apartheid and the genocide that Israel's committing against Gaza. Well, I think it's pretty, it's pretty simple. I mean, seeing the 7th of October and seeing what Hamas has done, uh, you realize all, all that stuff is pretty much bullshit. And it's, you know, we didn't, they attacked us, they started this war. And what they were doing is not conquering back land. They were doing pure murder, murdering babies, um, 
rape down, um, just pure massacre, the terrorism. That's not fighting back. That's not, you know what I mean? That just, it doesn't, that's not resistance. That's, it doesn't connect. It doesn't connect. So seeing that and seeing the true face of Hamas and what they represent, and then seeing in the houses Hamas support, just make the connection. Wow. You know, that does not stand for resistance. That does not stand, that stands, what they stand for is, is death to all Jews, you know, to get rid of Israel, and as for now, get rid of America, even like, they don't want peace. And they've been off of peace in the past. 17 times. 17 ceasefire offers. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty simple. It's, uh, <laughs> it's it's sad it's it's it it's sad. sad that people uh they as you've been you know rightfully saying can't do one plus fault yeah but yeah. but again i will i will say again it's uh you know the fake news and you know fake news again the fake news against us and it's just unbelievable it's it's so strong that you know if i'm just i imagine i put myself in their shoes living there and you know, all I see is the news and the news being pure lies, then like it makes sense in a certain way where, you know, you would believe this kind of stuff. But at the same point, I'm saying my solution is don't believe what you see on the news or what people tell you and just come look for your, come look, you know, in your own eyes, just come see it for yourself the strongest evidence you can possibly collect. And he... Are you frightened for America? You know, you mentioned this isn't just about Israel and death to Israel. This is death to America. As an American or somebody who came from Chicago, yeah. are you scared for what's to come for America? I am. I am. And I feel like if they don't, if they don't stop it now, then here it's it might be too late. And... I mean, just raw examples, like seeing a picture of Sinwar, you know, raised up in the middle of New York. Right? And you say, if you're allowing a picture of a terrorist to be in these protests and just raise, like, you, you see this and you realize how bad of a scenario we're in. It's, it's, it's terrible. It's, it's scary, yeah. It's definitely scary. And by the way, I have actually I have relatives uh, uh, in in America, in Maryland, in Kansas City. We have family over there. Uh, but again, views all over the world. We're all family, so I'm definitely I'm scared for scared for my family back in there, and I'm scared for. Generally, I'm a good person, so I'm scared for either for America too. You know, I, oh, yeah, that's scary. Outside of army, outside of the war, side of recovery. Outside of doing backflips, what do you see for yourself in the next five, ten years? First of all, I see greatness. Um, again, knowing what I've been through and seeing myself right now doing flips and staying positive. And I want to see a flip, by the way. Oh, for sure. Until, we'll definitely do that. Until I see a flip. We'll definitely do that. Yeah, yeah, again. It's just propaganda. Talking about, talking about uh, uh, seeing with your own eyes, we'll make it happen. Um, but it's, it's pure strength, you know, it's, it's just evidence of how, uh, what I'm capable of. And I really feel about my future. I, I feel a little unstoppable in that way. You know, I like, I'm alive and I'm stronger than ever. And after everything I've been through and after everything I've seen, like, I'm, I feel ready for life, mm. you know, like bring it at me. Yeah. Like I'm ready. That's, Please. that's the feeling. Man. What's your favorite sport? Ah, oh, it's so hard. It's so hard. I'm, I'm, I, again, I do some, I, I do parkour, I do flips, I play volleyball, I play soccer, I play basketball. You know, I do a unicycle now. Huh. How <laughs> about that for a flex? Yeah, for a free unicycle, athlete. man. That's what they call, uh, the cool kids call a weird flex, eh? Yeah. <laughs> for sure. What's, 100%. What's, who is one athlete that you've always looked up to? David Goggins. I don't know if, I don't know if you, you were, I, was, I know this, a uh, U.S. Marine. Yeah. Former U.S. Marine. Exactly. It would be cool if you could meet David Goggins. Oh, why? Why do you look up to David Goggins? Well, 
I look up to him because he represents uh, one of my main goals in life is that is to really have full control over your mind and just with that control be able to achieve greatness and this is a guy who he achieved that he ran on broken legs you know, went through hell it always looks to be uncomfortable he's his sentence is to be comfortable not being comfortable. So you're the Jewish David Goggins. Uh, I still got, well, I still got some ways, you know. I wish. But I would definitely, being a week with David Goggins, definitely a dream come true. That'd be awesome. That would be great.